Welcome to the Protestants and Politics Podcast. I'm your host, Nap Nasworth. I've been exploring the intersection of churches, Christians, theology, and public life for over 20 years as both a professor and a journalist. But I still have lots of questions. I invite you to continue learning with me as I interview interesting voices in this field. We're picking our religion based off our politics more and more every year now instead of the other way. So we have to think about politics being the first cause of everything, and then everything, including religion, lying downstream of that first cause. Who are the nuns, and why are they growing? This group includes atheists, agnostics, and lots of those who may or may not be personally religious, but don't affiliate with or count themselves among a particular religious group. As they grow in numbers, they're becoming an increasingly important part of the American political landscape. To understand this phenomenon, my guest is Ryan Burge, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Eastern Illinois University. An expert in religion and political behavior, Professor Burge has over 20 articles published in peer-reviewed academic journals. If you're a subscriber to my Protestants and Politics newsletter, you may already recognize his name because I share his work a lot there. We'll be talking about his new book, The Nuns, where they came from, who they are, and where they are going, which will be published on March 9th and is available for pre-order. Ryan Burge, welcome to the Protestants and Politics Podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Nap. I really appreciate it. So why did you write a book about the nuns? Because of a tweet, honestly. Uh, I I tweeted this, the the, the General Social Survey is this big survey. It's like the gold standard sociological survey in America. And every two years, they come out with a new wave of it. And they've been tracking religion since 1972. Um, And I tweeted out a graph where I just measured different religious groups over time. And I showed the nuns were now as large as evangelicals or Catholics for the first time in history. I tweeted that graph out and it just just took off. It it went viral. It got retweeted over a thousand times. Uh, It landed me in this in the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, the Daily Mail, I was on the front page of Reddit. It got upvoted 70,000 times, um, and it really sort of propelled me into sort of a different level of social media. I only had a couple hundred followers at that point, and, and, and now you know, I have I many, num- many more times that. So it sort of became what I was known for, for a lot of people, and it just seemed like that tweet had grabbed something in the cultural zeitgeist that I felt like people – wanted more of, but we're not getting more of because there's not a lot of quantitative social scientists who do this kind of stuff. So I thought this would be a great book to write because it's just descriptive describing what the nuns look like and how they, they, they look like demographically, but also, you know, explaining maybe some reasons how they got so large so fast. And I wrote it not for political scientists or social scientists or not even academics. I wrote it for just an educated lay audience. Like there's nothing fancy here. This is not an academic book. This is sort of a, a, a thoughtful trade level book, right? Like kind of in the middle between mass market and academia. I think that's really an unexplored market in this, you know, religious sociology of religion space. And I want to do more in that space. And so uh, folks are interested in, in particular in how nuns vote, or at least they were, you know, during the election. But you you talk about those three different groups here, atheists, agnostics, and nothing in particular. How are those groups different? Yeah, they're and in the book, I think I make this argument. I hope I make it well, but I do make this argument that you know calling the nuns the nuns is is really the functional equivalent of saying that all Protestants are the same, um, because anyone who grew up Protestant can tell you there's a humongous difference between an Episcopalian and a, and a Southern Baptist. Like they're they're not even on the same planet in a lot of ways. They agree on very little theologically or politically or socially. The same is true with the nuns. Um, Atheists are incredibly liberal. There's no group in America today, no religious group in America today that's more likely to grab on to the liberal label than atheists are. Um, They're they're heavily democratic. They actually see themselves to the left of the current democratic party. Um, They're the only group in America that sees themselves that way. So atheists are, have high levels of education, Many of them have high incomes and are have like a more sophisticated, they're very politically active too. They're just a more sophisticated, you know, slice of Americana. 6% of Americans are atheists. And then on the other end of the spectrum is this group called Nothing in Particular. Nothing in Particular is 20% of the population. So over three times as large 
as atheists, but you know, demographically, they're much different. For instance, 44% of atheists have a college degree, a four-year college degree, but only 22% of nothing in particular have a four-year college degree. Um, atheists are a lot less likely to have kids. They're 10%, 10 less likely to have kids at the age of 35 than a nothing in particular. Um, nothing in particular is don't get out uh, and do political activity that that much. They just seem like they're more disengaged from society in all ways, while atheists are just disengaged from the theological part of society, but still are very much involved in you know education, employment, politics. So they're really two groups that have very little in common, but we sort of lump them under this big umbrella for what they're not, which is religious. And hopefully we stop doing that in the future. You talk about many possible explanations as to why this group is growing. Uh, so let's talk about a couple of those. One, one, one of them you talk about is, you know, maybe they're just being more honest on the survey questions about what they are. Uh, so explain that. Yeah. So there's this concept in survey methodology called social desirability bias. And it's one of the things that we we try so hard to overcome but it's just the idea that people want to give answers on surveys that are socially desirable, but may not be always actually accurate. So we know there are certain kind of questions that social desirability bias is a problem. For instance, drug use. Everyone lies about drugs they did or did not do. Um, sexual partners, racism, sexism. But then the other one, and this is the most relevant for us, is church. Um, how much do you give to church? How often do you go to church? What's your, what your religious affiliation is? And we know that social desirability bias crops up more in face-to-face -face surveys because you have to look someone in the eye and say, I never go to church, which is, you know, it's it's for, you know, even though America is becoming less religious over time, you know, religion still holds sort of a vaunted place in American society and people sort of aspire to be religious. Many people do. So um, the General Social Survey has been asking these questions face-to-face -face since 1972. If And they say about 23% of Americans are religiously unaffiliated. If you look at internet-based surveys, which is just a you use a web browser, you don't have to talk to anybody, the share of Americans who are religiously unaffiliated is a lot higher than that. It's probably at least 30%, if not 32 or 33%, if you do it in an online scenario. What I think one of the reasons the nuns have grown so rapidly, though, is because becoming religiously unaffiliated has, has become much more culturally accepted today than it was 30 years ago. So as more people come out, it's easier to come out as a nun. Just I think in, in many ways people came out as, as homosexual. You know, For a long time, you didn't know anyone who was gay or lesbian because it just wasn't talked about. But as more and more people came out, it became you gave permission to other people to come out too, and it just sort of cascaded from there. I think a lot of that same process has happened with the religiously unaffiliated. And I'm not entirely convinced that really the nuns have risen as much as the nuns have just been revealed because now they're answering these questions on surveys more honestly today than they did 30 or 40 years ago. So if, if the nuns are increasing, at least in the surveys, that means another group is decreasing as a proportion of the population. Who, who, who's that? Well, it's really only one group. It's a group called mainline Protestants. And those are um, people who go to churches like the United Methodist Church, the Episcopalians, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the American Baptist Church. These are sort of the more moderate versions of a lot of conservative um, Protestant traditions. For instance, um, in the American Baptist Church, I'm an American Baptist pastor. We are LGBT affirming. We have women pastors. Um, the Southern Baptists are our cousins. They do not have women pastors, and they are not LGBT affirming, right? So the the main line, however, is the group that's being you know being decimated really. In 1976, over 30 percent of all adults in America were mainline Protestant. Um, three in ten. Today, it's 10%, so one in 10. Um, so in one in five Americans has basically left the mainline Protestant church over the last um, 40 years or so. And we know that a, a huge chunk of them went to become religiously unaffiliated. Not all, but a big chunk of them, because you look at evangelicals, they're the same size they were in 1988. Um, Catholics have basically stayed in the same sort of tight band of 22, 24% for over 20 years now. So they're not declining. Evangelicals are not declining. Really, main lines going down and the nuns rising up is the big story of American religious demography over the last four decades or so. Yeah, and one of the explanations you talk about, and it's something that I was introduced in grad school. I started in grad school in 1999, and that's uh, the secularization thesis, uh, this notion that as uh, economies modernize, that people become less religious. 
And at the time, where even today we talk about America as being an exception, you know, American exceptionalism, and that unlike other countries, America has stayed fairly religious despite having the largest economy in the world. One of the explanations uh, I heard back then was, well, it's, it's just taken slower. It's, it's, you know, it just happened. I'll be right about this. It just hasn't happened yet, you know, which seemed very unsatisfying explanation because you can always say, I'll be right eventually if you just wait long enough. But, but now when I'm, I'm looking at your book and looking at a lot, a lot of this data, it seems like, well, maybe they, they were right about something that, you know, it is just sort of taking a little bit longer in America. That's one of the hypotheses you tested. What's your view of the secularization thesis as an explanation? I think it's the primary explanation. I just don't see any other way that we get from. So if we, if you look at the data, though, it's really interesting because it, it doesn't happen in a sort of linear, consistent fashion. Between 1972 and 1990, the nuns went from like 5% to 7% in 20 years, which is, you know, it's growth, but not exponential growth. But then from that point forward, it goes up like a point a year going forward from, from 1992 or 1993 or so. I call it a hockey stick. Because it looks just like a hockey stick, flat, 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 boom, straight up and to the right. You know, kind of the growth you wanted to see like in your stock portfolio, boom, just straight up and to the right. I think secularization, it, it sort of, it was building, building, building behind the scenes of American life. And then, you know, there was this sort of confluence of events in the early 1990s, which sort of all the locks got blown off the doors of secularization. It actually started showing up in the data in real ways. I think secularization is is it, it was inevitable, and I talk about that in the book. I think secularization is an inevitable process. It will happen to all countries as they increase education and increase economic prosperity. I just think that's a reality of the social world. But I do think that certain things in America sort of accelerated those trends, and obviously one of them is politics. Um, because if you look at the evangelical line, evangelicals reached their apex in 1993 when they were 29.5% of the population. Now they're down to 235 But while evangelicals were going up, so were the nuns. I mean, I think there was this sort of um, – there was this, this cleavage process in American life where we saw – we've seen polarization. We talk about political polarization a lot, but we don't talk about religious polarization enough because I think that's also part of the story. And with the rise of sort of right-wing evangelical, hardline, anti-abortion, anti-gay, you know, religious right 1990s, that really turned off a lot of moderate evangelicals, but a lot of mainline Protestants too, who said, well, I'm a Protestant, but I'm not that kind of Protestant. I'm not a Falwell. I'm not a Robertson. I'm not a Jim Baker. Those aren't my people. But unfortunately, I'm being painted with the brush of these far right politicians. And I really don't believe a lot of this stuff anyway. So you know what? It's just easier to become religiously unaffiliated. Then I don't have to defend myself from crazy. I think a lot of that sort of coalesced, began to coalesce in the early 1990s. And then I think that social desirability, things started dropping off, which helped accelerate the numbers. But then, you know, the the linkage between the Christian right and the Republican Party got stronger. And then the Republican Party got more extreme to the right. And so it just sort of created this self-perpetuating cycle that got us from, you know, 7% to 23% in a span of about 25 years. It was all those factors sort of coalescing around at the same time and leading to that accelerated growth. Yeah, you you do keep bring you bring up that a lot in the book. You keep coming back to the Christian right, especially in the 1990s. You see in the data, you know that that's has a big influence. But kind of flesh out a little more, like how you're you're saying that it's the mainline Protestants who are decreasing, but the Christian right is mostly evangelical, mm -hmm. uh, and you're saying the Christian right is an explanation as to why the nuns are increasing. So how does that happen? Causal arrows are hard, right? It's hard to identify what, what caused one thing to happen one way or the other. What we do know is that the Christian right really started becoming part of the mainstream American culture in the early 1990s. So there's this thing called the Summer of Mercy, which happened in 1990, which is where like the pro-life movement in America got really loud and really militant and actually violent. Um, you know, they had these protests all over the country all at one time where people laying in front of cars in front of abortion clinics. There were abortion clinic bombings that happened at this point, it, you know, before this. And I don't think people realize that abortion politics has not always been so 
contentious as it is right now. I mean, this has become like a trope amongst people who study this stuff. But when Roe versus Wade was was handed down by the Supreme Court in 1976, the, the Southern Baptist Convention wrote a resolution that basically said, yeah, we don't love it, but it's really a decision between a woman and her doctor. You know, it just wasn't that pitched battle that it is now. And and what's funny is 40 years later, by the way, the Southern Baptists actually said their forefathers were 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 wrong, were heretical in that belief. Like not just we disagree with them, but they had a a wrong conception of the Bible and the issue. That just shows you like how things have polarized, right? So if you look at the data, 40% of people today who identify as very liberal are religiously unaffiliated. 40%. Amongst people who are very conservative, it's only 10%. So there's clearly a linkage in the American mind now between being religious and being politically conservative, especially if you're white. Um, because of the top 25 largest predominantly white Protestant traditions in America, 21 of 25 have majority Republicans now. So to be a white Christian in America is almost inevitably linked to being a Republican in America. And remember, a third of America is Democrats. So, you know, they have to go somewhere. And for them, the nuns are sort of this warm embrace because most of them are to the left of center. Some of them are to the a lot left of center. So it becomes a more hospitable place for you to go. Michelle Margolis talks about this in her book, From Politics to Pews. We're picking our religion based off our politics more and more every year now instead of the other way. So we have to think about politics being the first cause of everything and then everything, including religion, lying downstream of that first cause. Yeah, so we we often think about how politics can turn away people in the church. You know, if you have a pastor who gets really involved or a congregation that gets really involved in, in politics, and if you don't support those politics, then you, you f you're going to feel unwelcome and probably leave, maybe leave the church. But you also talk about it could the the reverse can ha can happen as well. You can actually attract people to the pews through politics, right? Is yeah, that what's so happening? I, th I think there's at least to the evangelical label. You know, there's this big there's this big myth, and I, I'm trying to write about this everywhere I can to try to dispel this myth that evangelicals are in decline. The share of Americans who identify as evangelical today is no different than it was 10 years ago. 24% of Americans self-identify as evangelical, which is really shocking if you consider all the baggage that the word evangelical has today that it didn't have even 10 years ago in terms of Trump, right? You would figure there'd be a drop-off there, but there's not been a drop-off there. What we've seen instead, though, is that evangelicalism has become a social, cultural, political moniker more so than it's become a religious term. And so the share of evangelicals who never attend church has doubled in the last 10 years. And I think that's largely because a lot of conservatives now who are not really religious think to be conservative, politically conservative in America today is also to be religious. So we're seeing sort of a evangelicalism is being buttressed, being reinforced by its political leanings. That's actually a net positive for them or not a net negative for them being so linked to the Republican Party because now they're getting a lot of not religious evangelicals in the fold. So their numbers still look good from that angle, but they look bad from the fact that they're becoming less devout over time. So, you know, taking a political position doesn't just lose things for evangelicals. It's not a, it's not a net negative, I don't think. In some ways, I actually think it's a net positive for them. So we have to be mindful that being political can be a benefit, but also a cost to your organization, and it works both ways. So you had mentioned that you're also an American Baptist pastor. American Baptist is a mainline denomination. Uh, thinking about this from your past pastoral role, is is that a problem for the faith if your faith is becoming more associated with a political agenda or a political party? Yeah, I I think, I, and I will be, you know. I will be a non-political scientist right now by saying that I think the church is the best when it has a multitude of political perspectives in the pews. And I don't even think that's really like me being normative. That's just me being objective. Because if you if you look at societies that do well, it's societies that have heterogeneous political views that discuss and engage with each other on a regular basis, which America does not right now. You know, if you look back in history, white Christianity in America used to be much more politically diverse than it is right now. For instance, in 1978, 
half of white weekly church going Christians were Democrats and 25% are Republicans. Oh, 35% Republicans. Today, 50% Republicans, 25% Democrats. You know, I think the church is better when it has 40% Republicans, 40% Democrats, 20% independents, because then you sit next to people in the pews who view politics differently than you, and you don't mischaracterize the other side, which is, I think, what's happening is we don't see people on the other side except on Fox News or MSNBC. We don't see them in real life. They're not our neighbors. They're not our church-going friends, right? They're not our family. So when we demonize the other side, we depersonify the other side. And I think churches used to be a place where that depersonification didn't happen because it was the, the deacons and the elders and the ushers and the Sunday school teachers and the worship leaders were people who voted for someone that I didn't vote for. But I know them and I like them and they're good people. So we can disagree on policy in a productive way. When church became overwhelmingly Republican, white church became overwhelmingly Republican. I think that's that's really tragic for the church. I think it's really tragic for the individuals involved. I think it's really corrosive and caustic for democracy as a whole because it just makes this polarization worse in American society. And churches used to be the thing that sort of glued us together. And now they're the thing that's actually helping drive us apart in many ways. I'm not too optimistic that the evangelicals are going to have a lot of Democrats come in anytime soon. And the mainline tradition, which used to have a nice mix and still does have a nice mix, by the way, of conservatives and liberals, is declining rapidly and aging rapidly every year now. And it's going to be 5% of the population in by 2030. So they're going to be almost completely irrelevant to the national conversation. These are things that we should be worried about going forward because all we're going to have left is evangelicals on one side, nuns on the other side, and a few people, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Mormons, kind of, you know, on one side or the other. That's not a strong American society going forward, I don't think. You've, you've written this book and for a broad audience. You know, this isn't a very political science-y type book. If, uh, if a pastor were to pick up this book, what is it you hope that they take away from it? I just hope they have a better, more accurate, more honest perception of the world around them. That is the thing that I am always aware of is that human beings are really bad about having an objective view of the world around them because we are constantly in a bubble, right? We can, we can curate our news feeds now, our, our social media feeds now in such a way that we only hear one thing or the other thing. And there are many evangelicals who will never come in contact with a nun during the course of most days. And there are a lot of nuns who will never come in contact with an evangelical. So what I hope pastors get is a better sense of what the nuns actually are. For a lot of them, they think they're all atheists. The reality is 6% of America is atheist, 6% is agnostic, and 20% is nothing in particular. So you're three times more likely to run into a nothing in particular than you are an atheist. And those nothing in particulars, by the way, are not as reluctant to go back to church as atheists. So, you know, we misperceive the problem. We perceive all the nuns being atheists when a lot of them are not atheists. Most of them aren't. So I hope they have a better and more accurate, you know, perception of what's going on with the nuns and really understand that a lot of nuns don't look like what you think they look like. Um, economically, they're hurting. I think socially, a lot of them are hurting. And I think that pastors need to understand that. But in the book, I also make the point that, you know, every row of a survey is a person right? Who has ho hopes and dreams and thoughts and fears and families and loves and hates and, you know, passions and all those things. It's easy to forget when I'm looking at, a, you know, a survey that has 500,000 respondents that that's 500,000 Americans that I'm looking at, right? That if there are 60 million nuns in America, there are 60 million reasons why people became nuns. That we need to all appreciate the diversity of um, opinions inside that community as well and listen to them individually. Some people became nuns because they had, you know, they were sexually abused by a priest. I mean, that that's happened or spiritually abused by a pastor or their parents spiritually abused them because of their religious beliefs. But then there are people who don't go to church because they move the service up 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. You know, so we got to understand that not everyone got to a nun from the same pathway. Now, there are some commonalities, but we still need to listen to each person individually as well and accept them for who they are. I hope I hope the book helps to kind of give the big picture but also, you know, doesn't get lost in the fact that every individual matters and that we should listen to them as well. What are you working on next? Oh, man, so much stuff. Um, Paul Jupe and I have a book that we are almost done with the first draft of. It's about the social, um, political and social implications of the rise of non-denominational evangelical Christianity in America. 
1996, four percent of Americans were non-denominational. Today, it's twelve percent. So, I mean, and at the same time, the share of denominational Christians has went from twenty-seven percent to sixteen percent. So, we're seeing this huge transference in the way that people are Christians in America. They're moving away from hierarchy. They're moving away from authority, from denominations to non-denominational. What does that mean? We found that non-denominational Christians are fundamentally different than denominational their denominational counterparts. So that's um, that's next on the agenda. Um, I have a, a book contract for book number two that we're in process of, of, of doing right now. That's going to be called something like 20 myths you believe about religion and politics in the United States. It's going to be just sort of these short little chapters, kind of myth busting a bunch of things that people don't understand or misperceive about religion and politics. Again, written for that sort of thoughtful trade audience, sort of the same pitch as the nuns, not for academics, but also, you know, not for the, you know, not for the masses, but for people who are interested, I think it'll be a really interesting book. So, um, and then we're always writing at religion and public dot blog, religion and public is our website. We actually had a post today about the ex evangelical movement. These are people who grew up evangelical, but left the church and are very vocal on social media about all the, 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 the things that they experienced being evangelical growing up. We find that only four or 5% of Americans are ex evangelical. They're just very loud on social, which is kind of the atheists are the same way. And Mormons are the same way too, by the way, Mormons are only 1% of the population. If you were on social, you would think it was 10 times that amount. So again, going back to the idea of perception versus reality, that's a lot of what we do uh, on religion and public dot blog. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryan Burge, R Y A N B U R G E. Um, you can go to my website, ryanburge.net, and you can pre-order the book, The Nuns, on Amazon. Actually, it will ship right now. Technically, it doesn't release till March the 9th, but there are shipping copies already. You can buy an ebook there, and there is an audio book uh, in the works that should come out at some point in the future. Ryan Burge, thanks for joining the Protestants and Politics podcast. Thanks, Nap. Appreciate it. This episode was recorded on March 1st, 2021. Be sure to sign up for the Protestants and Politics newsletter. You can find out more information at my website, mapnasworth.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>